Cardiomyopathies are diseases of the heart muscle tissue. Cardiomyopathies represent a heterogeneous group of diseases that often lead to progressive heart failure with significant morbidity and mortality. When talking about cardiomyopathies, we often focus on the ventricular heart muscles, the bottom two chambers of the heart. Remember, the heart is a muscular pump, which pumps blood all over our body. The cardiac muscle fibers, or cells, have a single nucleus. They are branched and joined to one another by intercalated discs. The intercalated discs contain gap junctions. The intercalated discs and gap junctions form a syncytium of cardiac cells, allowing the heart to contract in a coordinated, unified manner. The desmosomes hold the fibers together when the heart contracts. And the actual contractile units of the cardiac muscles are the sarcomeres, which is made up of myosin and actin filaments. These two filaments slide past one another to cause a muscle contraction. What happens is that the sarcomere shortens during muscle contraction. This is called systole. Systole is when the ventricles contract and pumps blood out. The sarcomere lengthens, and this is where the cardiac muscle cells relax. The relaxation process is termed diastole. This is when the ventricles fill with blood, preparing itself for another contraction. Because we're focusing on cardiac muscle cells and cardiomyopathies, we need to learn some fundamental physiology. Remember, there are three major determinants of myocardial performance. Preload, afterload, and contractility. Focusing on the ventricular cardiac muscle cells, preload is the amount of blood entering the ventricles during diastole, when the heart is relaxing. An increase in preload means a stronger contraction and this relationship is the frank starling relationship, which can be depicted with this graph here with di end diastolic volume on the x-axis, how much blood enters the ventricles, versus stroke volume, which is the volume of blood ejected by the heart with each uh, contraction. To put it simply, as more blood enters the ventricles during diastole, this increases the length of uh, the resting sarcomere, which builds up tension, kind of like a spring. Tension builds up as the ventricles fill with more blood and then bang, during systole, when the sarcomere shortens, it has all this tension and so it just increases the contractile force and therefore the stroke volume. An increase in end diastolic volume therefore increases stroke volume normally. Afterload is the other determinant of cardiac muscle function, and this is the force the cardiomyocytes must overcome to pump blood out of our body. Contractility of the heart muscle can be independent of preload, uh, and for example, the autonomic nervous system ions can influence cardiac contractility. To finish off this basic anatomy and physiology, diagram. You know, troponin is attached to the structures here and is important and involved in muscle contraction. Cardiomyocytes also contain many mitochondria to produce large amounts of ATP, which is needed because the heart muscles always demand this energy. It's constantly pumping. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common primary cardiomyopathy with a prevalence of 1 in 500 persons. It is defined as a left ventricular hypertrophy without chamber dilation. It is caused by an autosomal dominant mutation of genes that code for sarcomere proteins. The most common mutation is of the myosin heavy chain. There are secondary causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including chronic hypertension, which results in an increase in afterload, and thus the ventricles thicken as an adaptive mechanism to counteract the increase in afterload. Other causes include aortic stenosis.
There's also Frederick's ataxia, which is an autosomal recessive neurodegenerative mutation of the Freytaxin gene. Another cause is Fabry's disease, a genetic disease with a deficiency of an enzyme called alpha deloctosidase A. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there are two main types of the condition, essentially. You have the classic obstructive type, which is characterized by ventricular hypertrophy as well as interventricular septal hypertrophy, which kind of blocks the outflow through the aorta, as depicted. The second type is the non-obstructive type, which is your basic hypertrophy of the ventricles, meaning increased ventricular wall thickness. So when you think about it, during diastole, the ventricles are thick, and so there's not enough space. There's reduced ventricular filling. There's reduced preload. The end diastolic volume is reduced. And according to the Frank Starling mechanism, reduced end diastolic volume means reduced stroke volume resulting in a reduced cardiac output. However, an important concept to understand is that the ejection fraction here is still preserved because even though the end diastolic volume is low, all this blood that's already there is pumped out and therefore ejection fraction, at least in the early stages, are normal. The classic and main type of cardiomyopathy is the one with interceptal thickening. In this obstructive type, you still have left ventricular hypertrophy, resulting in reduced end diastolic volume, and so reduced stroke volume, and therefore cardiac output. With the obstructive type, the other mechanism of disease is where the interventricular septum thickening causes what's called left ventricular outflow obstruction, sort of like aortic stenosis. So during systole, less blood is being pushed through the aorta due to the outflow obstruction, resulting in reduced cardiac output. And here, the ejection fraction is usually low. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a diastolic dysfunction, leading to diastolic heart failure. The intraseptal hypertrophy can also result in mitral valve insufficiency. So the clinical manifestation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is variable from having no symptoms to having heart failure to even sudden death. Both obstructive and non-obstructive impairs diastolic filling and can lead to heart failure symptoms. However, when exercising, the outflow tract obstruction, for example, can cause more pronounced symptoms. And this is because during exercise, there is increase in heart rate and contractility, but overall reduced cardiac output. The cardiac output cannot meet the demand of the body. There is not enough oxygen to supply the brain and the heart. And so you start getting symptoms such as syncope, angina, and dyspnea with increased risk of arrhythmias. On examination, physicians may hear a systolic murmur, typically a crescendo-decrescendo murmur, like in aortic stenosis. This murmur increases in intensity with a valsalva maneuver. As an example, here is the normal crescendo-decrescendo murmur. And then with the valsalva maneuver, the murmur is louder. And this is because with valsalva, you are reducing preload, the amount of blood returning to the left ventricle. If you get the person to perform a hand grip or squat, this will reduce the murmur, and this is because you're increasing afterload. There's the classic S4 gallop, and it's best heard with the bell of the stethoscope at the apex of the heart. The characteristic sound of the S4 is created by the movement of blood during diastole from the atrial flowing against a stiff ventricular wall. It is also called the atrial gallop. Electrocardiography findings often show left ventricular hypertrophy here, deep Q waves, and left atrial enlargement, 
on echocardiogram, there's decreased left ventricular cavity size because of the thick ventricular wall and thick intraventricular septum. The ejection fraction can also be reduced. Doppler echocardiography is the modality of choice for quantification of the left ventricular outflow tract gradient in patients suspected of having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Increasingly, cardiac MRIs uh, have also been used for a diagnosis of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially when the diagnosis is uncertain despite echocardiography. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are at increased risk of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac deaths. The most common cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes and teenagers. Because of this, people diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy need a 24-hour halter monitor to check for arrhythmias and a stress test to assess for functional status and blood pressure response to exercise. All patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should undergo these uh, risk stratifications for sudden cardiac death and to be evaluated for placement of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Here is an example of a two-chamber ICD for prevention of sudden cardiac death, which can occur from a ventricular tachycardia. Patients should avoid strenuous uh, exercise as, again, this exacerbates the ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which can lead to those significant symptoms of angina, syncope, as well as dyspnea, and increased risk of arrhythmia. Beta blockers are the initial therapy in all patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Finally, surgical options such as septal myectomy or catheter-based alcohol septal ablation can be considered in people who essentially are still symptomatic despite maximal medical therapy 